The Trooping Fairies, Changelings Sometimes the fairies fancy mortals, and carry them away into their own country, leaving instead some sickly fairy child, or a log of wood so bewitched that it seems to be a mortal pining away and dying and being buried. Most commonly they steal children. If you overlook a child, that is, look on it with envy, the fairies have it in their power. Many things can be done to find out in a child a changeling, but there is one infallible thing. Lay it on the fire with this formula. Burn, burn, burn. If of the devil, burn. But if of God and the saints, be safe from harm. Given by Lady Wilde. Then, if it be a changeling, it will rush up the chimney with a cry, for, according to Giraldus Cambrensis, fire is the greatest of enemies to every sort of phantom, insomuch that those who have seen apparitions fall into a swoon as soon as they are sensible of the brightness of fire. Sometimes the creature is got rid of in a more gentle way. It is on record that once, when a mother was leaning over a wizened changeling, the latch lifted and a fairy came in, carrying home again the wholesome stolen baby. It was the others, she said, who stole it. As for her, she wanted her own child. Those who are carried away are happy, according to some accounts, having plenty of good living and music and mirth. Others say, however, that they are continually longing for their earthly friends. Lady Wilde gives a gloomy tradition that there are two kinds of fairies, one kind merry and gentle, the other evil and sacrificing every year a life to Satan, for which purpose they steal mortals. No other Irish writer gives this tradition. If such fairies there be, they must be among the solitary spirits, pukas, fur derrigs, and the like. The Brewery of Eggshells T. Crofton Croker Mrs. Sullivan fancied that her youngest child had been exchanged by fairy's theft, and certainly appearances warranted such a conclusion, for in one night her healthy blue-eyed boy had become shriveled up into almost nothing, and never ceased squalling and crying. This naturally made poor Mrs. Sullivan very unhappy. All the neighbors, by way of comforting her, said that her own child was, beyond any kind of doubt, with the good people, and that one of themselves was put in his place. Mrs. Sullivan, of course, could not disbelieve what everyone told her, but she did not wish to hurt the thing. For although its face was so withered, and its body wasted away to a mere skeleton, it had still a strong resemblance to her own boy. She therefore could not find it in her heart to roast it alive on the griddle, or to burn its nose off with the red-hot tongs, or to throw it out in the snow on the roadside. Notwithstanding, these and several like proceedings were strongly recommended to her for the recovery of her child. One day, who should Mrs. Sullivan meet but a cunning woman, well known about the country by the name of Ellen Leah, or Gary Ellen? She had the gift, however she got it, of telling where the dead were, and what was good for the rest of their souls, and could charm away warts and wens, and do a great many wonderful things of the same nature. "'You're in grief this morning, Mrs. Sullivan,' were the first words of Ellen Leah to her. "'You may say that, Ellen,' said Mrs. Sullivan, "'and good cause I have to be in grief,' for there was my own fine child whipped off from me out of his cradle, without as much as by your leave or ask your pardon, and an ugly dony bit of shriveled-up fairy put in his place. No wonder, then, that you see me in grief, Ellen. Small blame to you, Mrs. Sullivan, said Ellen Leah, but are you sure tis a fairy? Sure, echoed Mrs. Sullivan. Sure enough I am to my sorrow, and can I doubt my own two eyes? Every mother's soul must feel for me. "'Will you take an old woman's advice?' said Ellen Leah, fixing her wild and mysterious gaze upon the unhappy mother. And, after a pause, she added, "'But maybe you'll call it foolish?' 
can you get me back my child, my own child, Ellen? said Mrs. Sullivan with great energy. If you do as I bid you, returned Ellen Leah, you'll know. Mrs. Sullivan was silent in expectation, and Ellen continued. Put down the big pot, full of water, on the fire, and make it boil like mad. Then get a dozen new-laid eggs, break them, and keep the shells, but throw away the rest. When that is done, put the shells in the pot of boiling water, and you will soon know whether it is your own boy or a fairy. If you find that it is a fairy in the cradle, take the red-hot poker and cram it down his ugly throat, and you will not have much trouble with him after that, I promise you. Home went Mrs. Sullivan, and did as Ellen Leah desired. She put the pot on the fire and plenty of turf under it, and set the water boiling at such a rate that if ever water was red-hot, it surely was. The child was lying, for a wonder, quite easy and quiet in the cradle, every now and then cocking his eye that it would twinkle as keen as a star in the frosty night over at the great fire and the big pot upon it. He looked on with great attention at Mrs. Sullivan breaking the eggs and putting down the eggshells to boil. At last he asked, with the voice of a very old man, "'What are you doing, Mammy?' Mrs. Sullivan's heart, as she said herself, was up in her mouth ready to choke her, at hearing the child speak. But she contrived to put the poker in the fire, and to answer, without making any wonder at the words, "'I'm brewing, Avic.' "'And what are you brewing, Mammy?' said the little imp, whose supernatural gift of speech now proved beyond question that he was a fairy substitute." I wish the poker was red, thought Mrs. Sullivan, but it was a large one and took a long time heating, so she determined to keep him in talk until the poker was in a proper state to thrust down his throat, and therefore repeated the question. Is it what I'm brewing, Avic? said she. You want to know? Yes, Mammy, what are you brewing? returned the fairy. Eggshells, Avic, said Mrs. Sullivan. Oh, shrieked the imp, starting up in the cradle and clapping his hands together. I'm fifteen hundred years in the world, and I never saw a brewery of eggshells before. The poker was by this time quite red, and Mrs. Sullivan, seizing it, ran furiously towards the cradle, but somehow or other her foot slipped and she fell on the floor, and the poker flew out of her hand to the other end of the house. However, she got up without much loss of time, and went to the cradle, intending to pitch the wicked thing that was in it into the pot of boiling water, when there she saw her own child in a sweet sleep. One of his soft round arms rested upon the pillow. His features were as placid as if their repose had never been disturbed, save the rosy mouth, which moved with gentle and regular breathing. The Fairy Nurse by Edward Walsh Sweet babe, a golden cradle holds thee, and soft the snow-white fleece enfolds thee. In airy bower I'll watch thy sleeping, where branchy trees to the breeze are sweeping. Shuhin sho, lulo lo. When mothers languish broken-hearted, when young wives are from husbands parted, ah, little think the keeners lonely, they weep some time-worn fairy only. Shuhin sho, Lulo lo. Within our magic halls of brightness trips many a foot of snowy whiteness. Stolen maidens, queens of fairy, and kings and chiefs a sloshy airy. Shuhin sho, Lulo lo. Rest thee, babe, I love thee dearly, and as thy mortal mother nearly. Ours is the swiftest steed and proudest that moves where the tramp of the host is loudest. Shuhin sho, lulo lo. Rest thee, babe, for soon thy slumbers shall flee at the magic kolshi's numbers. In airy bower I'll watch thy sleeping, where branchy trees to the breeze are sweeping. Shuhin sho, lulo lo. Jamie Freel and the Young Lady A Donegal Tale Miss Letitia McClintock. 
Down in Fanet, in times gone by, lived Jamie Freel and his mother. Jamie was the widow's sole support. His strong arm worked for her untiringly, and as each Saturday night came round, he poured his wages into her lap, thanking her dutifully for the halfpence which she returned him for tobacco. He was extolled by his neighbors as the best son ever known or heard of, but he had neighbors of whose opinion he was ignorant, neighbors who lived pretty close to him, whom he had never seen, who are indeed rarely seen by mortals except on May Eves and Halloweens. An old ruined castle, about a quarter of a mile from his cabin, was said to be the abode of the wee folk. Every Halloween were the ancient windows lighted up, and passers-by saw the little figures flitting to and fro inside the building, while they heard the music of pipes and flutes. It was well known that fairy revels took place, but nobody had the courage to intrude on them. Jamie had often watched the little figures from a distance and listened to the charming music, wondering what the inside of the castle was like. But one Halloween, he got up and took his cap, saying to his mother, I'm away to the castle to seek my fortune. What? cried she. Would you venture there? You that's the poor widow's one son? Dinna be so venturesome and foolish, Jamie. They'll kill you, and then what'll come o' me? Never fear, mother. Nay harm will happen me, but I'm on gay. He set out, and as he crossed the potato field, came in sight of the castle, whose windows were ablaze with light that seemed to turn the russet leaves still clinging to the crab tree branches into gold. Halting in the grove at one side of the ruin, he listened to the elfin revelry, and the laughter and singing made him all the more determined to proceed. Numbers of little people, the largest about the size of a child of five years old, were dancing to the music of flutes and fiddles, while others drank and feasted. "'Welcome, Jamie Freel! Welcome, welcome, Jamie!' cried the company, perceiving their visitor. The word welcome was caught up and repeated by every voice in the castle. Time flew, and Jamie was enjoying himself very much, when his host said, "'We're going to ride to Dublin tonight to steal a young lady. Will you come too, Jamie Freel?' "'Ay, that will I!' cried the rash youth, thirsting for adventure." A troop of horses stood at the door. Jamie mounted, and his steed rose with him into the air. He was presently flying over his mother's cottage, surrounded by the elfin troop, and on and on they went, over bold mountains, over little hills, over the deep log swilly, over towns and cottages, when people were burning nuts and eating apples and keeping merry Halloween. It seemed to Jamie that they flew all round Ireland before they got to Dublin. "'This is Derry,' said the fairies, flying over the cathedral spire, and what was said by one voice was repeated by all the rest, till fifty little voices were crying out, "'Derry! Derry! Derry!' In like manner was Jamie informed as they passed over each town on the route, and at length he heard the silvery voices cry, Dublin, Dublin. It was no mean dwelling that was to be honored by the fairy visit, but one of the finest houses in Stephen's Green. The troop dismounted near a window, and Jamie saw a beautiful face on a pillow in a splendid bed. He saw the young lady lifted and carried away, while the stick which was dropped in her place on the bed took her exact form. The lady was placed before one rider and carried a short way, then given another, and the names of the towns were cried out as before. They were approaching home. Jamie heard Rathmullen, Milford, Tamney, and then he knew they were near his own house. "'You've all had your turn at carrying the young lady,' said he. "'Why wouldn't I get her for a wee piece?' "'Aye, Jamie,' replied they pleasantly. You may take your turn at carrying her, to be sure. Holding his prize very tightly, he dropped down near his mother's door. Jamie Freel, Jamie Freel, is that the way you treat us? cried they, and they too dropped down near the door. Jamie held fast, though he knew not what he was holding, 
for the little folk turned the lady into all sorts of strange shapes. At one moment she was a black dog, barking and trying to bite. At another, a glowing bar of iron, which yet had no heat. Then again, a sack of wool. But still Jamie held her, and the baffled elves were turning away, when a tiny woman, the smallest of the party, exclaimed, "'Jamie Friel has her away frae us, but he sall he nae good at her, for I'll mek her deaf and dumb,' and she threw something over the young girl. While they rode off disappointed, Jamie lifted the latch and went in. "'Jamie, man,' cried his mother, "'you've been away all night. What have they done on you?' Nathing bad, mother. I had the very best of good luck. Here's a beautiful young lady I have brought you for company. Bless us and save us, exclaimed the mother, and for some minutes she was so astonished that she could not think of anything else to say. Jamie told his story of the night's adventure, ending by saying, Surely you wouldn't have allowed me to let her gang with them to be lost forever. But a lady, Jamie... How can a lady eat weir poor diet and live in weir poor way? I ax you that, you foolish fellow. Weel, mother, sure it's better for her to be here nor over yonder, and he pointed in the direction of the castle. Meanwhile, the deaf and dumb girl shivered in her light clothing, stepping close to the humble turf fire. Poor Crather, she's queer and handsome. Nay wonder they set their hearts on her, said the old woman gazing at her guest with pity and admiration. "'We mon dress her first, but what, in the name of fortune, hey I fit for the likes o' her to wear?' She went to her press in the room, and took out her Sunday gown of brown drugget. She then opened a drawer and drew forth a pair of white stockings, a long snowy garment of fine linen, and a cap, her dead dress, as she called it. These articles of attire had long been ready for a certain tryst ceremony, in which she would some day fill the chief part, and only saw the light occasionally when they were hung out to air. But she was willing to give even these to the fair and trembling visitor, who was turning in dumb sorrow and wonder from her to Jamie, and from Jamie back to her. The poor girl suffered herself to be dressed, and then sat down on a creepy in the chimney corner, and buried her face in her hands. "'What'll we do to keep up a lady like thou?' cried the old woman. "'I'll work for you both, mother,' replied the son. "'And how could a lady live on we're poor diet?' she repeated. "'I'll work for her,' was all Jamie's answer. He kept his word. The young lady was very sad for a long time, and tears stole down her cheeks many an evening while the old woman spun by the fire, and Jamie made salmon nets, an accomplishment lately acquired by him, in hopes of adding to the comfort of his guest. But she was always gentle, and tried to smile when she perceived them looking at her, and by degrees she adapted herself to their ways and mode of life. It was not very long before she began to feed the pig, mash potatoes and meal for the fowls, and knit blue worsted socks. So a year passed, and Halloween came round again. Mother, said Jamie, taking down his cap, I'm off to the old castle to seek my fortune. Are you mad, Jamie? cried his mother in terror. Sure they'll kill you this time for what you done on them last year. Jamie made light of her fears and went his way. As he reached the crab tree grove, he saw bright lights in the castle as before, and heard loud talking. Creeping under the window, he heard the wee folk say, "'That was a poor trick Jamie Friel played us this night last year when he stole the nice young lady from us.' "'Aye,' said the tiny woman, "'and I punished him for it, for there she sits, a dumb image by his hearth. But he does not know that three drops out of this glass I hold in my hand would gee her her hearing and her speeches back again.' Jamie's heart beat fast as he entered the hall." Again he was greeted by a chorus of welcomes from the company. Here comes Jamie Friel. Welcome, welcome, Jamie. As soon as the tumult subsided, the little woman said, You be to drink to our health, Jamie, out of this glass in my hand. Jamie snatched the glass from her and darted to the door. He never knew how he reached his cabin, 
but he arrived there breathless and sank on a stove by the fire. "'You're kilt surely this time, my poor boy,' said his mother. "'No, indeed, better luck than ever this time,' and he gave the lady three drops of the liquid that still remained at the bottom of the glass, notwithstanding his mad race over the potato field. The lady began to speak, and her first words were words of thanks to Jamie. The three inmates of the cabin had so much to say to one another that long after cockcrow, when the fairy music had quite ceased, they were talking round the fire. "'Jamie,' said the lady, "'be pleased to get me paper and pen and ink that I may write to my father and tell him what has become of me.' She wrote, but weeks passed and she received no answer. Again and again she wrote, and still no answer. At length she said, "'You must come with me to Dublin, Jamie, to find my father.' "'I had no money to hire a car for you,' he replied. "'And how can you travel to Dublin on your foot?' But she implored him so much that he consented to set out with her and walk all the way from Fannet to Dublin. It was not as easy as the ferry journey, but at last they rang the bell at the door of the house in Stephen's Green. "'Tell my father that his daughter is here,' said she to the servant who opened the door. The gentleman that lives here has no daughter, my girl. He had one, but she died better nor a year ago. Do you not know me, Sullivan? No, poor girl, I do not. Let me see the gentleman. I only ask to see him. Well, that's not much to ax. We'll see what can be done. In a few moments, the lady's father came to the door. Dear father, said she, "'Don't you know me?' "'How dare you call me your father?' cried the old gentleman angrily. "'You are an impostor. I have no daughter.' "'Look me in my face, father, and surely you'll remember me.' "'My daughter is dead and buried. She died a long, long time ago.' The gentleman's voice changed from anger to sorrow. "'You can go,' he concluded. "'Stop, dear father,' till you look at this ring on my finger. Look at your name and mine engraved on it. It certainly is my daughter's ring, but I do not know how you came by it. I fear in no honest way. Call my mother. She will be sure to know me, said the poor girl, who by this time was crying bitterly. My poor wife is beginning to forget her sorrow. She seldom speaks of her daughter now. Why should I renew her grief by reminding her of her loss? But the young lady persevered till at last the mother was sent for. Mother, she began when the old lady came to the door, don't you know your daughter? I have no daughter. My daughter died and was buried a long, long time ago. Only look in my face and surely you'll know me. The old lady shook her head. You have all forgotten me. But look at this mole on my neck. Surely, mother, you know me now? Yes, yes, said the mother. My Gracie had a mole on her neck like that. But then I saw her in her coffin and saw the lid shut down upon her. It became Jamie's turn to speak, and he gave the history of the fairy journey, of the theft of the young lady, of the figure he had seen laid in its place, of her life with his mother in Fanet, of last Halloween, and of the three drops that had released her from her enchantment. She took up the story when he paused, and told how kind the mother and son had been to her. The parents could not make enough of Jamie. They treated him with every distinction, and when he expressed his wish to return to Fanet, said they did not know what to do to show their gratitude. But an awkward complication arose. The daughter would not let him go without her, "'If Jamie goes, I'll go too,' she said. "'He saved me from the fairies and has worked for me ever since. "'If it had not been for him, dear father and mother, "'you would never have seen me again. "'If he goes, I'll go too.' "'This being her resolution, "'the old gentleman said that Jamie should become his son-in-law. "'The mother was brought from Fanet in a coach and four, "'and there was a splendid wedding.' They all lived together in the grand Dublin house, 
and Jamie was heir to untold wealth at his father-in-law's death. The Stolen Child W.B. Yeats Where dips the rocky highland of Sleuthwood in the lake, there lies a leafy island where flapping herons wake the drowsy water rats. There we've hid our fairy vats, full of berries and of reddest stolen cherries. Come away, O human child, to the woods and waters wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Where the wave of moonlight glosses the dim gray sands with light, far off by furthest rosses, we foot it all the night, weaving olden dances, mingling hands and mingling glances, till the moon has taken flight. To and fro we leap and chase the frothy bubbles, while the world is full of troubles and is anxious in its sleep. Come away, O human child, to the woods and waters wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Where the wandering water gushes from the hills above Glencar, in pools among the rushes that scarce could bay the star, we seek for slumbering trout, and whispering in their ears, we give them evil dreams. Leaning softly out from ferns that drop their tears of dew on the young streams, Come, O human child, to the woods and waters wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. Away with us he's going, the solemn-eyed. He'll hear no more the lowing of the calves on the warm hillside, or the kettle on the hob sing peace into his breast, or see the brown mice bob round and round the oatmeal chest. For he comes, the human child, to the woods and waters wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than he can understand.